Hi there. What we're going to do in this video is we're going to actually take apart one of the detectors. I'll show you what the scintillator looks like and uh, also the silicon photomultiplier. Uh, I'll describe the digital and analog electronics on the main PCB, main printed circuit board. Uh, and then what I'd like to do is talk about uh, how to configure uh, your two detectors to set them up in an optimal way to make your measurements. Okay, let's get started. Great, so we have our Cosmic Watch detector here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to open it up and remove the physical detector. So on the back of the detector, there's a back faceplate. If you remove the four screws and remove the nut from the SMA connector, the back plate pops off and you're left with access to the actual uh, detector on the inside. The detector can be removed by pulling on the SMA connector and the detector should slide out with a little bit of force. Once the detector is out, uh, we'll just put the enclosure off to the side for now. The detector itself, is broken up essentially into two main components. There's the SIPM and or the silicon photomultiplier, which I'll refer to now as the SIPM uh, and scintillator combo. And then there's the main PCB here, that, which contains all the digital and analog electronics. We're going to now open up this particular component and see what it's made out of. So this component is made out of a piece of scintillator, a five centimeter by five centimeter by one centimeter piece of scintillator. There's a circuit board which contains the silicon photomultiplier, the SIPM, uh, which is six millimeters by six millimeters. Uh, and on the back of this board, there's some, some biasing electronics, but that's about it. And what happens is essentially when a charged particle passes through the scintillator, uh, it's able to excite the, the scintillation molecules inside here. And once it de-excites, it's gonna emit some photons, uh, which we can then see with the silicon photomultiplier. So what this looks like is if I take a UV light, rather than, I don't have access to particles right now, if I take a UV light and I shine it onto the scintillator, you can see that there's this nice uh, sort of 400 nanometer uh, glow being emitted from the scintillator. And it's actually these photons that we're trying to detect uh, as a particle travels through the scintillator. So what happens, particle travels through the scintillator, it excites uh, some molecules. As these molecules de-excite, they emit photons. And these photons we're going to see with this single photon detector, this, this silicon photomultiplier. So this essentially just interfaces like that. We, we, we would wrap it in some sort of reflective foil, and then we put this optical isolation tape around the entire, entire assembly, and that is this component here. Okay, I'm going to put this off to the side for now. Now let's look at the main board. So the main board is divided up into the digital electronics on the top and the analog electronics on the bottom. On the digital side, uh, you can see we've already talked about the OLED screen uh, and the LEDs. You should be familiar with how those function now. There is also this, this giant battery here. This is actually to keep track of what time it is. It's a real-time clock battery. So every time you upload code to this detector, it, it will take the time off your computer and this battery provide, allows it to remember what time it is. There's a little buzzer here which allows you to add any sort of music or noise, kind of like a Geiger counter if you wanted to play a, a click every time it saw an event or something. We've talked about the coincidence connector. Um, this six pin connector here, this is what uh, communicates with the, uh, the, the, the scintillator SIPM assembly. And then here is the TNC 4.0 microcontroller. So this microcontroller contains an ADC and a 600 megahertz CPU. And uh, the ADC we're using to actually measure the waveform from the SIPM after some analog uh, circuit shape, uh, pulse shaping. Um, but the, the, the microcontroller here also controls everything else. It's able to send digital information to say the OLED or to flash the light or to, to send uh, uh, text through the serial connection out to your computer. You can see the, uh, the reset button as well as the SMA connector on the back, which you're already familiar with from the first video. There's a second SMA connector here, uh, which you don't have access to when this is in the enclosure. And this provides sort of one simple function, uh, which I thought might be useful to you if you're, you have some special measurement that requires very uh, fast pulses. And what this does is uh, there's a little jumper here. I'm not sure if you can see it. Yeah, you can see there's a little jumper here on, on two of these pins. If you were to zoom in here, you can see that it's actually labeled fast on the PCB. I put a jumper on the fast connection here. And what that does is it sends the fast pulse from the SIPM out through this connection. So uh, what that is is recall that this connector here, when you saw the pulses, they might have been hundreds of, nano, hundreds of nanoseconds in width. The fast output 
is, is much quicker, and it's maybe only tens of nanoseconds in width. width. It's too fast for us to actually do anything with a slow microcontroller. However, um, oscilloscopes are able to measure this fast output, uh, and actually it turns out your red pataya can too. So if you require a very fast rise time on the order of sort of two to three nanoseconds, this might be the connection that you want to use. The only thing that I can see this being used for at this, at this moment, besides, uh, besides for educational purposes, would be to actually measure this, the, the, the velocity of muons, which I haven't done yet. Um, however, that's, that's mainly why I included this connection. All right, if I flip over the board, uh, what you can see is you can see uh, primarily a bunch of electronics down here. And essentially what this is, is that pulse that you, show, that you, you saw in the previous video is basically just sent through some, some chain of amplification and peak detection uh, analog electronics. And what this does is essentially amplifies the pulse and stretches it in time such that it's a large enough pulse that this slow microcontroller can actually make a measurement uh, and infer some sort of information about what that pulse looked like. And that's essentially what all of this down here is doing. This middle area here is just for, this is, well, this part here is for biasing the SIPM, and this part here is just providing the voltage necessary for um, operating these, these, these two op amps here. Um, down in this corner, this here is a BMP280, and this is just a pre pressure and temperature set sensor. So you might have noticed on the data, if you've looked at it already, that every event, we measure the pressure and temperature uh, of this detector. Temperature probably isn't of use, because temperature will give you the local temperature. Pressure will be, give you barometric pressure, and that is correlated with the, mu with the muon atmospheric flux. And so that's the primary reason why we, we, made, we included this. Great, so that's the detector assembly. Um, fits together. There's actually two screws here, which I've already taken off prior to this video. Uh, you can put it back into the assembly if you would like to. Or uh, the benefit of doing this, which I'll talk about in a second, is if you have two of these detectors, placing the scintillator as close together as possible like this allows you to capture the maximum uh, muon rate possible. You know, if I, if I separate these further and further apart, the solid angle subdued be between these two goes down, uh, and therefore the rate between the coincidences goes down as well. So if you require high statistics or a full sky view of what the muon flux looks like, this is how you would probably want to operate. And if you look at the instruction manual, I talk about this method quite a bit. So let's, uh, let's now discuss uh, some, some measuring um, tips on how to actually make measurements with these detectors. Great, okay, so I have four sets of coincident detectors here. Each one of them is sort of arranged in a different configuration. Uh, these are described more in detail in the instructions manual. Uh, I'm gonna briefly go over it here as well. So each one of these configurations is used essentially for a different type of measurement. This particular configuration is very, is very standard just for measuring uh, rates. If you were to imagine what sort of muon trajectories can trigger this detector, uh, think about a muon coming in from uh, directions from about here to maybe here are able to penetrate both detectors, trigger both. However, a muon coming in from this horizontal direction, well, you cannot draw a straight line through the, the scintillator with a muon coming in this trajectory that will trigger both detectors. So this particular configuration is looking at a part, portion of the solid angle sky subdued by maybe something like that, okay? If let's say you did want to look at a portion of the sky very precisely, you can use a configuration that might look more like this. So a trajectory that might be able to trigger these two detectors would be almost vertically downwards. These are downgoing muons. These muons, uh, you know, if it has a more horizontal direction, will not trigger both detectors. So you're really looking at a very small angle of the sky. And you have the ability to look at an even smaller angle of the sky if you simply move this top detector further away. Now you're looking at a much smaller solid angle in the sky. And so you can select out what part of the sky you want to look at, look at sort of like a telescope, uh, using the detectors in this configuration. And this particular configuration would be useful for measuring the cosmic ray angular dependence. Cosmic ray muon angular dependence, apologies. Uh, this one here we briefly already talked about. This one uh, measures the full sky. So I took the two detectors out of their cases and I placed the scintillators touching each other. And you can imagine a cosmic ray muon traveling from essentially any direction is able to traverse both pieces of scintillator, trigger both scintillators. And if you were to actually look at the rate, you would notice that the rate uh, in this configuration is much higher than say the rate in any of these other configurations. 
So this particular configuration I use very often for uh, whenever I go on a, a plane, uh, a plane flight, uh, uh, an airplane flight, uh, to measure the actual muon rate while I'm while I'm while we're climbing, descending, and at, and at altitude. And you can look at uh, some of those measurements um, inside the uh, the instructions uh, lab manual. The final configuration here. Uh, is rather unique and it looks at uh, muons coming in from one direction and not the other. So the reason for this is a muon uh, traveling in horizontally uh, could potentially trigger both detectors. However, the muon flux, the horizontal muon flux is zero. Muons produced in the atmosphere, if you were to draw a line where the atmosphere actually uh, is, uh, if you look at it horizontally, uh, it's much too far for muons to actually traverse and so the flux actually falls to zero horizontally. However, as you start going above the horizon, there becomes a measurable muon flux. And so what, what you can imagine is you can imagine this particular configuration can see muons with trajectories that maybe are from horizontal up to maybe about there. From the other direction, again, muons coming in horizontally could trigger, but there is no muons coming in horizontally. And if we go slightly up, uh, you can see we no longer, perhaps this should be you know, upside down so the simulator is closer to the bottom. If we go slightly above the horizon, then we cannot trigger both detectors. And so pretty much the flux in this direction goes to zero, and the flux in this direction sees everything from you know, a trajectory like this. So this configuration is looking muons coming in, and this direction is uh, uh, from the west, this direction is from the east, and you can measure the east-west asymmetry in the muon flux by simply measuring the, the, the rate in this configuration, and then swapping size like that, and then making the measurement like that. And there is actually an east-west asymmetry, and I'll let you read about that in the instructions manual um, as well. I make a measurement of that uh, during one of the plane flights that I've, uh, that I've taken. And that ends this video. Uh, what we did here is we took apart a detector, gave you an idea of how it works, uh, and then I described uh, briefly how to set up the de detectors in different configurations uh, to make uh, specific measurements. Uh, this is all described in the lab, ma lab manual as well, so feel free to have a look there. Uh, if you have any questions, just let me know through email. Thanks.